Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello welcome viewers to the second live session of this course and particular course uh, fanatics and phonology a broad overview so many of you have been following the lectures and taking the assignments and uh, diligently following the course and uh, we uh, hope that this is catering to your whatever requirements that you have in phonetics and phonology and what we have to remember is that this is a uh, this is a broad overview. So very often we did not go to the details of many things and the live sessions are uh, is, It's an opportunity for many of you to uh, ask those questions if you would like uh, however today what I plan to do is um, give you a, uh, an overview of an overview of overview of the overview of the course which is um, the, the course is called Phonetics and Phonology a broad overview because um, as I just said we do not want to go into uh, very uh, very many theoretical details or details technical details and give you an overview of a very broad domain uh, which um, related to sounds in uh, linguistics and also um, and phonetics and we also try to um, include a bit of uh, intonation and other prosodic aspects. So um, today what I would uh, like to uh, do is uh, cover some of the important things that I uh, talked about in this course and the, the, the lectures which were there in the course and the main uh, concepts which we covered in uh, each of those uh, lectures. So. Uh, let me uh, begin by talking about uh, we're talking about uh, the first part of the course which is about um, uh, so the first part of the course was about um, um, articulatory phonetics so we we began by talking about sounds and how they are not equivalent uh, to spellings which we learn as uh, in school, so the, the alphabet system that we learn in school is not equivalent to the sounds that we produce. So that is um, that is a hurdle which is uh, which has to, has to be overcome when one has to study sounds. So because we are used to thinking of sounds in terms of alphabets, so there's not a, so there is a correlation, but uh, often uh, we do not find the correlation. So that is the. Uh, so that is the uh, problem of uh, the lack of the correspondence. So, um, so um, now we uh, um, and after that we also uh, we also looked at. Uh, the IPA, the International Phonetic Association's uh, symbols. So uh, when we looked at the symbols, we realized that the IPA system has its uh, has has a way of representing. So uh, the IPA system has a way of representing. So, um, and this is the phonetic chart that we're talking about, the International Phonetic Alphabet. And um, this, uh, this alphabet is representative of most of the languages of the world. So it, it is revised often to be as inclusive as possible of all the sounds of the world's languages. And notice that this is many uh, levels. So, um, so this is the international IPA chart, uh, your pardon. 
So this is the IPA chart which we showed you. This has uh, been developed by the International Phonetic Association and this is the revised 2020 uh, chart which means it's revised um, every uh, after after some time, so that the more languages we know about, the, we try to be as inclusive as possible of all the phonemes in the world's languages. And notice that there are um, there's not just the consonants. So we have consonants which has all the pulmonic sounds. So um, we'll talk about the pulmonic aggressive air system. So airstream system, which we uh, talked about in the course, and these are the pulmonic aggressive um, airstream uh, sounds produced from the pulmonic aggressive airstream. And then we also have the non-pulmonic airstream uh, sounds, and then we have the vowel chart. And we have a few other symbols, which are, um, which are quite unique in the way they're produced. The voice labial below approximant and the voice labial palatal approximants. And we try to discuss those sounds when we try when we discuss the sounds of the world's languages. Now, um, apart from that, we also have the diacritics. So the diacritics show that um, there are various changes, there are various um, uh, subtle things that are there in sounds. For instance, a voice sound may be, be voiceless, and then uh, what is actually a voice sound and the devoicing has to be shown with a diacritic, which you see as the small circles beneath the sounds. And then uh, voiceless sounds can be voiced. So we have the, you know, we have uh, these diacritics, <clears throat> the curly diacritic there for the um, voice sounds, which are for the voice, uh, voicing of sounds which are actually voiceless. We have aspiration here. We have we have uh, symbols, the diacritics to show roundedness, less roundness advanced, retracted, and um, so on and so forth. So also dental, apical, laminal, and these are distinctions which we have studied in both the uh, sounds of the world's languages as well as when we study features in the world's languages. And then uh, also we have uh, in the IPA chart, we have ways of showing suprasegmentals and also tones and accents in the world's languages. So this is in um, a nutshell, um, the the wide variety that we uh, that we come to see in the world's languages is represented by the International Phonetic Alphabet in um, system in this way. And um, the more you want to learn about different languages in the world, the more you have to rely on this alphabet system because this gives you a very concise way of understanding all the sounds that are possible in the world's languages. So now, um, in the course, we have seen this, um, we have uh, gone through this quite a bit, that to produce speech, air must flow from the lungs through the vocal tract and the vocal folds. And most of the sounds of world's languages are produced through this mechanism. And and then through the vocal tract and vocal folds, and after that, the vocal tract modifies the air push of the lungs, and then we have the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, etc., to modify the air which has been pushed out and give its particular shape in terms of consonant and vowels. And a vowel fold vibration produces voicing for some sounds, and these are the very important things which we uh, have to consider when we are studying sounds voicing, the airstream mechanism. And um, then the various um, other properties that the sounds that the sound might have, the lowering of the velum leads to the uh, production of nasalized sounds. So um, this is um, this is uh, these are some of the few characteristics of the sound of the world's languages, which we will we, which we have come across in this course often, and now we are review, reviewing those things and. Uh, Reminding that these are the things that we have to always uh, remember when we are studying sounds. So the airstream mechanism, the role of the glottis, and the role of the other uh, 
the parts inside the vocal tract in production of the sound. So this is the uh, airstream mechanism and whenever we have the pulmonic airstream mechanism, it's air pusher lungs, which of which you saw in the IPA chart that most of the world's language, the sounds of the world's languages are produced as a result of pulmonic aggressive airstream uh, system. And however, there are other airstream mechanisms. We have the glottalic, we have the valeric. So the glottalic produces the, um, the ingressives and the implosives. And then we have the uh, Villaric airstream mechanism, which produces ingressive sounds, which are um, clicks. And also, when we studied sounds of the world's languages, we saw how clicks are produced in the world's languages. So, um, uh, this shows the importance of the airstream mechanism in producing different types of sounds. And then we also saw the articulators, the different articulators. We, we understand now that various parts of our oral system, the vocal system that we actually use for other purposes are also integral for producing different kinds of sounds, different kinds of contrasts in sounds. So we have the upper teeth there, the lower teeth, these are all um, articulators. The alveolar, the alveolar ridge, the hard palate, the soft palate, and um, the pharyngeal region, the nasal cavity, the epiglottis, the esophagus, and the trachea. So um, they all play a role in the production of the, the sounds that we have in the world's languages. Now, these are the active articulators, which actually are the articulators which can move in a certain direction to produce the articulation. We have the tongue, uh, the lower lip, which can move, the uvula can move, the glottis can move, etc. So, um, we have uh, studied quite a bit about the role of the larynx, which is like a valve. It's encased in cartilage, it opens, it, it, it vibrates and, and gives particular shape to the sounds, um, or, or particular quality to the sounds that we produce. And uh, this voicing that, that is produced as a result of the vibration of the glottis and the, the air which passes through vibrating larynx, it leads to voicing. So this is very important in understanding about sounds and then we have um, a manner of articulation. So uh, which we cannot probably show here. So which you have seen in the uh, in the in the in the course, the movement of um, or the the tongue, the movement of the tongue towards a certain region will produce certain kinds of fricatives. You can have a, the, the, the lateral, um, the tongue in the lateral position will produce a lateral fricative. Now what is, so these are the different places, but the manner of articulation that we're talking about here is that of the fricative. So how is the fricative produced? The fricative is not produced like a plosive, and these are very important distinctions. A plosive, as we can see here, is um, complete closure. Whereas uh, a fricative is not complete closure, it's a partial closure. And this is not the only difference that we have we have slow release along with the partial closure, and that's how uh, fricatives and stops 
and uh, it for, for explosives or stops, along with complete closure, we have sudden release. There are other differences as well, but these two uh, make, the, make the two of them very different consonants. And then there are other manners of articulation like approximate, where there is um, where the closure is uh, the, the the degree of of, um, of closure is not as much as that of stops or fricatives, and these are like r, y, l, etc., which are the concept, the approximants across different languages. So um, then we have uh, vowels which which we know that, which do not need the, any kind of obstruction, which is, which is marked by free airflow. So that is the fundamental difference between vowels and consonants. One has free, free airflow, the other does not. So, uh, so the the free airflow that we are talking about is not is is um, important, but there are uh, very many um, important things that are uh, that gives particular shape to the vowels. The vowels are um, uh, are organized in a system of horizontal levels. So uh, where we have uh, levels of high and low. We have front and back. And so the extreme positions here and here and here, these are called the reference points. We attribute this uh, cardinal vowel system to the 20th century English phonetician Daniel Jones, who showed us that a vowel can be understood um, in terms of representation as uh, a system of where, where we have uh, vertical and horizontal extremes, and then they, they can, we can understand them as, uh, uh, as high, low, front, back, and everything in between. We have central and mid vowels arranged in these spaces. Okay? And then, apart from front, back, high, low vowels. Another important quality of vowels is that of rounded, unrounded. In, in the cardinal vowel system of this, quad, this vowel quadrangle, this is a vowel quadrangle and in this vowel quadrangle, uh, rounded and rounded uh, vowels will be shown in terms of pairs, rounded and unrounded. Okay, so we'll have we can have a front high rounded unrounded vowel. We can have a back high rounded unrounded vowel. So um, the cardinal vowels can be imagined to be. Uh, articulated within this part in the mouth. So the vowel quadrangle that you just saw with the extreme referent points uh, which um, stand for the high, um, high or uh, low or front, back, etc. can be understood to be represented within, um, within the, uh, the, the oral system and you can imagine that a front vowel is produced somewhere near the, uh, the front of the mouth, the back, because of the the way the cavities are are um, uh, used for the production of these sounds, we production of these vowels, we think of them as high uh, front and high front and high back, low front and low back. Okay. So this is these are the primary sets of vowels. And then we have the secondary set of vowels arranged in this vowel quadrangle. And um, we have discussed these different vowels, but that's the way we understand the quadrangle. That um, this, now this, notice that 
Oh, in one set, the primary set, we have the front uh, unrounded. In the secondary set, we have the front rounded. Okay. And similarly, for the back, uh, we have the back rounded. And in secondary set, we have the back unrounded. And we have discussed why uh, this is the primary set, this is the secondary set, because um, it's, it's more unusual to have front round vowels than it is to have back um, rounded vowels. And it's more un unusual to have back unrounded vowels than to have back rounded vowels. So proceeding now uh, to Proceeding now to, um, uh, to the central set. So this is the central set and again, I uh, will not discuss the airstream mechanisms. It's just a review. Uh, those are the airstream mechanisms and um, the articulators and which we ha and we have seen the passive articulators, the, the active articulators, and all, all the relevant uh, s properties of these uh, different articulators that are uh, very important in understanding how one sound is different from the other sound. Okay, so uh, again, these are um, uh, we talked about manner of articulation, we skip place of articulation. Uh, remember this is for consonants and not for vowels. So vowels essentially, um, always keep this in mind that when we're talking about vowels, we always think of the vowels in terms of the quadrangle. We'll not think about uh, separately about is it palatal or velar or uvular because Essentially, vowels have no obstruction, and that's why they, they have free airflow. The only way the distinct characteristics of vowels are possible is because they are um, because of the uh, different cavities inside the mouth, which are uh, producing the vowels either by lowering the jaw or by uh, rounding the lips or by uh, drawing the lips back, drawing the tongue backward. So, and thereby using the different cavities inside the mouth. So this is for vowels and place of articulation, manner of articulation and voicing exclusively for consonants. Okay. So now when we're talking about consonants, we have the, these very important places, palatal, velar, uvular, and as you know, what is a place of articulation? It's a place where the obstruction happens for con consonants. And that's why place of articulation is relevant only for consonants and not for vowels. So we did manner of articulation. Now, um, so place of articulation, manner of articulation, uh, and voicing. So this wraps up consonant articulation for us. I'll quickly, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly now um, go to a bit of acoustic phonetics and then I'll also try to include a bit of phonology um, for you. So, um, this is this was this, the the third part of the course, uh, the, uh, the second or third part of the course, where we talked about sound waves. Okay, so what are sound waves, and how do we uh, hear them? Right. So I think we cannot use the 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 I cannot use the uh, the video here of the transverse waves, which you will see, which you can play the the lecture and see that how transverse waves are different from longitudinal waves, etc. But uh, let us let us now uh, just quickly look at this diagram. It's the basic property of sound waves. Okay, it's, uh, so sound waves have a period that is cycles of repetition. Okay, so the, they have to be equal, though, and that's why and that's when we have 
periodicity if it is non periodic okay so if it is um, this periodicity now what is the source of this periodicity the source of this periodicity is the glottis which is so important for studying sounds so this is the glottis which will produce the repeated vibration and produce the periodicity and this uh, equal these equal cycles per second which will give us the period okay is uh, also the basis of understanding sound waves now uh, these are sinusoidal sound waves which means these are very simple there is only <clears throat> one cycle here not so we don't have um, diff we don't have a complex sound wave here the complex sound wave is what is um, what we find for uh, human sounds this is a sinusoidal sound and therefore we have just one repeating pattern we do not have multiple repeating patterns so in this one repeating pattern so we can very clearly see two things compression and rarefaction so the compression is the region of increased pressure which is this one and this is the rarefaction which is the region of decreased pressure and this period happens in a this this is equal and so again from here to here it is in the same repeating period and that's why this is a sinusoidal sound wave but this in essence is uh, how we uh, we break down a periodic sound even for human speech so um, so we have studied uh, these things transverse waves and longitudinal waves so uh, how um, uh, transverse waves are different from longitudinal waves and um, all sound waves are longitudinal waves and we, you also saw that how a longitudinal wave traveling in travels in the form of compression and rarefaction which you just saw and we had shown this with the movement of particles moving uh, to one position and then going back to the other position so this was this is how a longitudinal sound wave would behave. And then the other important properties are uh, uh, maximum displacement from the equilibrium position, uh, which is sound waves and the extent of uh, the variation of air pressure. So, um, which will tell you about the amplitude. Amplitude is connected to loudness and the more a loud sound the amplitude will be higher and these are the basic things that we studied in acoustic phonetics and um, so um, so we saw an example of a simple wave with a simple harmonic motion but acoustic properties of sound waves and um, uh, are um, as I just said uh, is, um, is not one repeating pattern we have multiple repeating patterns which you see here in figure 7 so uh, and so so sorry we have two identical sine, sine, sine waves here we, we will have another one here with um, yes so this is a, a typical this um, the output spectrum with multiple um, multiple repeating patterns is what we see now uh, what we see here is also the source filter theory which is very important when we talk about acoustics so the source filter theory now we've just learned uh, or we've just seen all throughout the course that very important for all periodicity is our glottis the larynx that's that which leads to the periodicity now it's not as if it the periodicity just happens in the source in the larynx in the glottal region and we just hear it as is no our vocal tract is is like a um, is like a musical instrument think of it as a musical instrument it filters everything that is produced from the laryngeal source and as a result of which the not just the source but also the properties of our vocal tract, the filter will produce an output, okay, which is what we hear as our sound uh, sounds produced by him as a result of human speech. So um, this is called the source filter theory. There's a source and there's a filter. 
two very important components in understanding the acoustics of sounds. So, um, when we are studying acoustic phonetics, we have to understand what are formants. So, formants are regions of um, energy which are, um, which are accentuated because of certain frequencies inside um, in our vocal tract. So, uh, those energy regions are accentuated uh, because of the resonance inside the vocal tract. Now, why does this happen? Now, once you have periodicity, so let me just quickly, uh, so once we have periodicity of the glottal source, it produces, the, uh, and we have what is called the fundamental frequency as a result of which, so our vocal tract, each, your vocal tract, my vocal tract, they're repeating at a certain fundamental at a certain frequency. So, this fundamental has um, repeat, has harmonics, which means it has resonances, the, this fundamental frequency has um, at integer multiples, it has, um, it has Reson it has resonances in integer multiples. So, it, which means if there is, if if your final frequency is 100 hertz, then at uh, till uh, you will have 200, 300, 400 various harmonics of that fundamental frequency. Now, when we have formants, some of those harmonics will be highlighted by the uh, filter that we just studied the filter is our vocal tract. Those harm, some of those harmonics will be accentuated by the vocal tract. And that is a function of the vocal tract. It will accentuate some of the harmonics. And as a result, you will hear different vowels as, so you, that's why R sounds different from E and E sounds different from U. And how we calculate those formants, the um, the uh, the way of this is the ideal idealized way of so how we actually an algorithm will calculate the formants is slightly different but this is the idea behind calculation of the formants so suppose we take uh, the vocal tract an average vocal tract length is 17.5 centimeter and then uh, the three formants of this vowel schwa is calculated with this formula and which is uh, so, which is n minus one into c by four l, four l being the the uh, length of the vocal tract into four. So this is a uh, this is the formula which will give you uh, the three different uh, formants of the vowel schwa. So the, its first formant is five five hundred hertz, second formant is fifteen hundred hertz, third formant being twenty five hundred hertz, and uh, these three hertz, th these three formants are the regions where you will see when you will see a spectrogram, you will see that it's, it's a sure these uh, three parts are, these three frequencies have very dense energy in, um, in the vowel. So that's because that, uh, that's because the, uh, these are the resonant, these are the frequencies in which there is energy in this vowel. Okay. So, and however, we have to remember something. We have to remember is that now this formula is used for sure. Not all vowels um, can be calculated using the same um, same um, formula because uh, the sure is special. The sure is special because for the articulation of the vowel a, uh, we use the most neutral. Um, the, the most neutral shape of the vocal tract. So, whereas for the production of other vowels, we do not have such a neutral. So, hence, only the length of the vocal tract is enough to calculate this, um, the formants of this vowel. And we have more complicated um, ways of uh, calculating F1, for instance, E, 
uh, we have to talk about the Helmholtz resonance and for, for, for the first format of the vowel E because again as we remember recall we talked about the different um, cavities uh, when, when we have different vowels. So I have some time to talk about um, I have some time to talk about uh, the phonology. So, um, so, phonolo uh, so now uh, phonology and phonetics. So we are talking about a broad overview of phonetics and phonology. Uh, I, I guess I do not need to repeat this, but phonetics is, is about the physical properties. And phonology, on the other hand, is about mental representations. Okay. Now, um, hence uh, there is a there is a difference between the way we talk about the visit. More and more, we see that in 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 uh, the literature, in the way that we conduct experiments, phonetics and phonology come together a lot. But there is a fundamental difference because phonology will always look for the way a sound is mentally is, is uh, the representation the abstract properties and phonetics will always uh, be about the physical properties so phonetics need not really bother about what is the mental representation how we are we're storing a sound in our mental maps uh, so that's not really important in phonetics however uh, well, that's very important in phonology hence when talking about phonology we will hypothesize rules for the uh, for the way we see uh, sounds are occurring in the phonetics because when we're producing sounds it's often the case that there'll be one sound will be different from the other but it's but phonologists will say that regardless of the fact that they're different when they produce they can be the in the mental representation they can be the same sound So phonetics uh, sounds vary with the context and phonology hypothesizes rules to characterize this variation. And the sequencing and distribution of speech sounds is important in phonology. And phonology also talks, uh, is, is interfaced with the other uh, grammatical components, morphology, syntax, etc. And um, importantly, when you talk about uh, phonology now, different from phonetics is that um, important things in, in phonology is how are sounds different from each other? How do we make up the words in a language? Obviously, one, one sound has to be different from the other to make a very basic distinction between two different words, right? So that's how a pat will be different from bat, which is very, if you think about it in terms of phonetics, the difference is not so much. But in, 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 the, in the phonology, this contrast is important because it tells you that the meaning is different just because of that contrast. Now, uh, so what we talked about just now is <clears throat> conceptualized in, in phonology like this. So we have an abstract level and then we have a uh, concrete level. In the abstract level, that's how we are storing the sound in the mental representation. However, when in, in terms of the production, it will vary. So, suppose we take a, uh, an English vowel. Uh, English vowels have this property that they will be long before voice consonants and they will be short before voiceless. And then we can, but uh, it's the same vowel. It's just that it's a property of the language that one becomes long and one becomes short. And but there's no need to um, to uh, sh to to incorporate that in the study of the phonology because that's sort of an automatic rule. So any speaker of the language will uh, will employ that. So um, so and similarly, um, various other rules like English. English also only has alveolar N, no, right? However, it can become dental because English also has dental fricatives. Dental fricatives. Now, if there's a dental fricative, what is actually alveolar will become dental. 
Now that is what uh, phonetics does, the, the presence of um, these phonetic, the phonetic properties does to sounds. It makes them change from their actual mental representation to something different in the production of speech. So, um, hence we also talked about features and representations and um, so all these uh, mental representations are important when you're talking about phonology. The representation of, uh, of sounds as formal objects which, um, which have definite, very definite, which are definite mental, mental entities. So, um, so th that's how you see that uh, phonetics and phonology are different. Uh, the way um, representation is viewed in phonology is things like feature representation. Sounds are represented in terms of features because groups of sounds behave in the same way. And also, um, phonetic, allophonic changes can be shown with the help of rules. Something changes to something else in this environment. X goes to Y in the environment. Z is a format for writing phonological rules. And um, now, uh, uh, when we talk about intonation, we talked about how intonation. Um, I have uh, I have skipped a, a lot in the phonology of, uh, of of the world's languages, which we had in the course. And though we we talked about morphophonology, we talked about uh, stress, we talked about syllables, um, and um, phonotactics and morphophonological complexities and then prosody and uh, tone and uh, intonation in the final uh, uh, part of the course. Now I'll, I'll wrap up my um, uh, lecture today with how intonation makes a difference. So I have skipped a major part of phonology and now I'm uh, talking about uh, intonation because that's the last part of this course on phonetics and phonology a broad overview so uh, we had seen how intonation makes a difference so remember how we uh, played uh, we play these sounds um, these sentences so what types of foods are good source of vitamins so either the reps response could be legumes are a good source of vitamins and or you can say legumes are a good source of vitamins or you can also say legumes are a good source of vitamins so depending on so if that, so you can have three different ways of answering that question depending on the, if the question is different but if you have what types of foods are good source of vitamins you can say legumes are a good source of vitamins or um, uh, you can say uh, legumes are a good source of vitamins <clears throat> so uh, So um, when you when you are uh, in intonation, what you are doing is that with the, with the pitch and other properties, suprasegmental, what is known as suprasegmental or um, prosodic properties, you could um, the meaning, the implied meaning could be uh, could be slightly different based on where where you are putting emphasis and. Uh, what kind of contour you have while you're answering the question. So, uh, and uh, and we had another sentence like, I'd fly to uh, Davenport I on, on TWA. Uh, TWA, so th if the answer is TWA doesn't fly there, uh, there could be two different types of answers. So either they, f they fly to Des Moines, and they fly to Des Moines, so either um, you are um, sort of uh, questioning, uh, not un uh, so when you say that TWA doesn't fly there, depending on the intonation of um, of would they fly to Des Moines, you might be, you might have a s simple declarative answer, or you might actually have a uh, have a sort of a um, questioning sort of a, uh, answer, and all of that makes a difference to the meaning of the sentence. And again, uh, when there is um, ambiguity in a sentence, the always uh, intonation can, um, can um, change the, 
meaning. So here we have a sentence uh, where uh, vitamins is uh, put in bold there. So there here in the sentence, you can see the pitch contour, it steadily rises towards the end. So what does this rise mean? It, it means that vitamins is emphasized here. Legumes are a good source of vitamins. So it's not, so what does this mean? It means that legumes are not a good source of proteins uh, or maybe also a good source of proteins, but definitely a good source of vitamins. So this high pitch there, rise and fall, shows that the vitamins is emphasized there. Unlike, um, so, um, and another important thing here to note is that the pitch contour is broken in these places. It's, it, we do not have one straight pitch contour. It shows that all these different consonants are attributing their properties. This is called microprosody and very often we ignore microprosodic effects when we're talking about intonation because they do not sh show us much about the international contour. And then unlike uh, legumes are a good source of vitamins, we can say legumes are a good source of vitamins, right? So we can, which means legumes are a good source of vitamins, not for instance, uh, wheat or rice or bread. So instead of bread, you know, legumes are a good source of vitamins. So um, intonation does have a lot of, uh, adds a lot of meaning and the pitch contour and the tune and the text and the alignment will tell you a lot about the intonation. So the, this rise fall that we have, that we see here, um, legumes are a good source of vitamins. So this is uh, the same tune which means arise, uh, it's steadily rise and then fall, same tune, but the alignment is different. The alignment shows that this rise fall is on good instead of vitamins or legumes. And again, here a rise fall, uh, as we studied just now, it's on the vitamins. And, and then we have um, here a broad focus sentence where we where we do not really, we're not really emphasizing just one part. Legumes are a good source of vitamins as a general declarative sentence saying something matter of fact and not emphasizing you know, one part of the sentence to, so as to give a particular meaning to that sentence. So this is just a declarative sentence and uh, this is called broad focus and all the previous instances we would call them narrow focus sentences. Narrow focus sentences, these were narrow focus. This is also narrow focus. However, this is a broad focus sentence. And then finally, the tunes of the text, okay? The tune of text uh, will determine what kind of sentence that is. So we can have um, a yes, no question tune. Um, are legumes a good source of vitamins? So which, um, and the answer to that question would be yes or no, depending on uh, <clears throat> whether you think legumes are a good source of vitamins or not. So uh, yes, no question tune will be our legumes are a good source of vitamins. So, and then there's a slow rise and, and then we have yes, no questions where we can ask whether good are legumes a good source of vitamins. So again, um, where you have uh, showing that you can also question a part of the sentence. Now we can have, again in this sentence, we can have surprise contour tune, we can have emphatic tune, legumes a good source of vitamins. So again, you can have a surprise tune there, you can have, um, uh, or you can have a WH questions, what are good source of vitamins? Again, where the question, the tune is different. So these are the important things when you're studying uh, uh, intonation, broad focus, narrow focus, alignment, text, tune, and um, the rise and the fall and the, the, the contour and where the fall is, where the rise starts, the, the rise starts normally at the prominent uh, part of that sentence and then 
uh, if it's a yes no question, rise all the way up. If it's a WH question, it's on the WH part, what or where, where you have the rise. And then if it's a prominence, narrow focus, then it's the uh, narrow, the part of the word which is narrowly focused. Um, so the, uh, legumes are a good source of vitamins or legumes are a good source of vitamins. So depending on which part you're emphasizing. So uh, this is also, uh, this can be studied in phonology as in terms of phrasing, in terms of tune text alignment, in terms of um, rise and falls and very interesting studies can be carried out in terms of meaning, uh, the correspondences with meaning, etc. also. And if you're interested, you can uh, carry out these studies. So thank you for listening. And um, so I think there are some questions. Uh, explain feeding, bleeding, counterfeeding. Oh yeah. So when you're talking about rules, so when a rule, when there are two rules, so suppose there are two rules X and Y, and uh, um, and the one rule is providing the environment for the application of the other rule, that is feeding. Okay. So and when you have bleeding, the rule, the second rule is taking away. Okay. If you think about it, if you, if you just think about it in terms of abstraction, so one rule is just taking away the, uh, the environment for the occurrence of this, uh, the first rule. So suppose there's a rule, let's make up two rules. So suppose there's a rule saying that if there is a, um, if there are two voiced uh, consonants, uh, if there are two consonants and one is voiced, then the other will also be voiced as a voicing assimilation rule. But now we have a second rule which deletes consonant clusters. So, so suppose uh, now we have uh, uh, suppose the two consonants occurring next to each other. One is a um, one is a, a f and one is a l, and because the presence of l, the f is definitely going to become uh, changed to v, which is a voice counterpart. Counterpart. Now we have a rule de saying delete avoid CC or delete one consonant, delete the consonant on the uh, right. And now that takes away the uh, the environment for the occurrence of the second rule. So that's a bleeding rule. So, and then we have um, uh, counterfeeding, which is again, um, you have the, uh, which is of course the counter to the feeding. So it, 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 um, you have a you have a feeding rule, but it is it is countered. So um, and we we uh, it's a feeding rule. The the counterfeeding rule is slightly different, difficult to give an example without um, uh, without a right example. But feeding and bleeding is is the most is, is the simplest way of understanding both counterfeeding and counterbleeding is also so countering the feeding and countering the bleeding. So if you understand feeding and bleeding then it's easier to understand counterfeeding and counterbleeding. And uh, difference in type of coda consonant, long vowel or a diphthong effect, syllable weight, which among the following words have a heavy syllable, palm, pat, pan, patch, pouch, pain, peel, peak, pack. A coda consonant, long vowel or diphthong effect, I, I think what you're asking is uh, the question is is about um, so uh, something you have to remember is that whether a coda consonant lends weight uh, syllabic weight in the language or not may be entirely uh, language dependent. Okay, so um, uh, so in English. Um, um, uh, Yes, so in English we have coda consonants. So in, in, the, these examples, I assume, are from English, and in English uh, we we have both um, uh, vowels and so long vowels and uh, f final uh, consonants lend coda weight. And uh, which among the following words have a heavy syllable? So I assume these are all uh, with coda consonants. So in because English is a language which is syllable weight. So they would all be, be attributing to to the coda, okay, to, to weight. Okay. 
So, uh, but remember this, that this may not, uh, so not in all languages are coda consonants um, attributing to syllabic weight, but English is a language where we have coda consonants uh, have weight, okay? So, uh, I do not understand about the trapezium. I think that question is related to the vowel diagram, the vowel quadrangle. So, the vowel quadrangle is of that shape. So, if you consult Daniel Jones, it's because of the uh, how front the front vowel is. And because if you, if you think about the shape of uh, our vocal tract, then um, when we produce a vowel, uh, such a low vowel, it cannot be, uh, even if it is front, it cannot be that much front as the, um, as the high vowel E. So, um, as a result, it, has the, it, it is given that particular shape and that's why it has a certain ratio of 4 to 3 to, uh, 4, 3 to 1 uh, and that's why the quadrangle is of that shape. Uh, prepare for the exam. So, pre please um uh, look at please listen to all the videos and go through the course materials and uh teachers say the elements of sounds that we can control uh, the elements of sounds that we can control independently uh, what does independent control uh, i think um the question is not very clear Mm, I think independent control uh, is not about voluntary uh, controlling. It's about uh, it's it's about languages and how they uh, arrange features uh, in in their uh, individual languages. So I think I I really don't understand the question, but maybe there is something more. So what are bimeric vowels? So you can have uh, so. A mora, um, so um, uh, a, a, a consonant can uh, lead to a mora. So if there are two moras, then it's bimoraic, obviously. So and um, if you have um, if you have a vowel and a consonant in the uh, final position, then um, um, so if you have. Um, yeah, so if you have, sorry, if you have two consonants, so you have bi, uh, bimoracity there. And then uh, some things which we have not covered in this, um, in, in, in this uh, lecture so much is that we have super heavy syllables. We do not just have heavy syllables. There are languages which have super heavy syllables with more than um, two, three consonants in the moraic position. And then there are some languages which will lengthen the, the vowel also uh, to um, uh, quite a bit. So uh, having so there could be super, super heavy syllables also. So we have not ex discussed those examples, but keep in mind that those kinds of languages are also there, which have very heavy syllables in the coda position. And um, um, yeah, so for the time being, for this course, we just talked about codas and heavy syllables and uh, long vowels contributing to the mora. So, uh, no, so we produce the diagrams. No, so you, uh, you will not have such questions, but you, keep in mind, you need to know the diagrams because you will get questions uh, based on the diagrams, but you will not be asked to reproduce the diagrams. Okay. So I think uh, we have, uh, come to the end of this live session. Uh, I don't see um, any other question here. And thank you very much for all of you who participated and uh, we can keep the discussion going in the following sessions. Thank